and it's especially nice to see uh, former students. Uh, if I don't recognize you at first, it's because I've never seen you in a suit and a tie. <laughs> and you've, you've probably never seen me in a suit and a tie either, right? <laughs> right? So as, thank you, Simon. Uh, as Simon said, I think mostly about corporate governance. I hope not narrowly. And I'm going to talk about some of the implications of, so, of uh, work I've been doing over the last 10 years or so. Uh, how to think about corporate governance. Um, what I say may sound like opinions, but they are opinions that I would not have had unless I did the research in the first place. Uh, I can refer to models, and there's some models cited at the back of this uh, presentation, which you can get copies of, I'm sure. And uh, building these models of how individuals behave in, in uh, public corporations is not always easy. Uh, the point of it is to try to find a simple way of describing how individuals, particularly managers in public corporations, behave, and then try to get an opinion that's based on that. So I'm just saying this in, in uh, preparation because I've taken out all the math. I've, I'm just going to give you some implications. But they're not just ideas that have dropped out of the sky. I, I, they've developed as a result of research over 10 years or so. OK? So perhaps, perhaps a presumptuous title. How do you think about corporate governance? I don't think we think about it very well, at least to read the papers. Um, for example, when you hear somebody talk about or write about corporate governance, you ought to ask, what is the problem that they're worried about? Is it that CEOs are overpaid? That's a frequent concern. Uh, is it that CEOs always want to overinvest stockholders' money? Yeah, sometimes people are worried about that. Uh, European academics like to say that there are private, that is, psychological benefits of control or empire building that CEOs like to have. That's perhaps a concern. And some people think of, the, of a public corporation as if it were a democracy where the shareholders are the citizens and the managers are the elected officials. And if we have imperfect democracy, something must be wrong. Uh, all of these things may be concerns in some situations, but I think very often it's not so much thinking as just complaining. OK, so I'm going to talk about what we'd like to have is a way of thinking about governance and financial management, and I'm going to focus on mature public corporations that tracks investment, financing, and payout. The uh, papers cited at the bottom are listed at the back. And um, we're going to take this in three steps. First of all, what kinds of corporations ought to be public in the first place? And that's going to hinge, as you see, on human capital. Second, it's the human capital that makes uh, governance work in the end, if the governance works properly. And, but, and I'm going to show you some, idea, some simple examples of how governance would work ideally. But of course, once you have the simple example, you see all of the simplifications, you immediately think of the things that can go wrong. And I will list the things that can go wrong and then try to draw some conclusions, OK? So here's where we start. I want, to, want your uh, help in filling in these boxes. The question is whether a corporation should be public or private. OK? And I'm going to divide corporations between youth, maturity, and old age. Old age means a declining business. And I'm also going to divide them into three categories. One would be commercial real estate, developed commercial real estate. The other would be some kind of operating business, a manufacturer, for example. And the third would be a law or consulting firm. And the question in each case is, do we put public in the box or do we put private in the box? Which is more efficient? You got the problem? The where you want to start. How about the bottom row? So think of a uh, law or consulting firm. And ask yourself, could such a firm survive as a public corporation? The answer is no or at least not usually. 
In fact, uh, back in the hot days of late 90s, there were several economic consulting firms that seized the opportunity to go public, and all but one failed very quickly. And the reason is that in order to support the market valuation, you had to sell the future profits from human capital. Okay, if you succeed in doing that, then the people who are contributing to human capital also want the profits from their own activities, and so you're essentially trying to sell human capital twice. No, no surprise that they melted down. And therefore, it's no surprise that law firms are, are private, consulting firms are private, there are exceptions, I know. Uh, you could argue that maybe an investment bank depended crucially on human capital. Uh, Goldman Sachs, let's say, or say a really big public consulting firm like Accenture. But I would argue, if we wanted to get into it, that in those cases, the organizational capital has replaced the human capital and the company is not at risk, or is not trying to sell human capital in the same way a consulting firm would be. So there's an exception. But I would argue that we should fill in the bottom row with private. Fair enough? All right, let's try the top row. Most commercial real estate is privately owned. Not by individuals, but by insurance companies, pension funds, and so on. And if you stop and think about it, you might say, wait a minute, this hotel, as it's developed, the value of this hotel doesn't depend on human capital. Maybe when it was built, or conceived, it depended on human capital, but it doesn't now. Huh? And we observe that almost all commercial real estate is privately owned. Now, again, there's exceptions. Uh, REITs, R-E-I-T's, are public instruments that own um, developed real estate, but I would argue that's an exception because investors want that asset class, but not because it's particularly efficient more, not because it's more efficient for an asset to be held in a REIT than privately, but simply because investors want some of that, okay, so you give them some. But REITs are still a very small fraction of the developed real estate market. Okay, so I'm feeling private across the top. All right, how about operating businesses? We can start with startups. You can't very well imagine a startup going public early on it's a matter of scale. And in the high-tech venture capital business, it's also necessary for investors to have a hands-on role in helping the company to develop. Okay? Um, the, uh, the problem here is that entrepreneurs, the people who are starting up the companies, are always willing to keep on investing other people's money, even when the probability of success is relatively low. Do you need somebody to sort out the winners from the losers. And I have this quote, I forgot where this came from, but it's a good quote. The secret of success in venture capital is not to pick winners, but to shut down the losers before you spend too much money. Or as John Doerr from Kleiner Perkins uh, recently commented, the lemons mature early. <laughs> yeah. Now about old age. Well, the problem here is very different. It said, Managers of companies don't like the companies to shrink because they're basically shrinking their own jobs and their compensation. And that's why you get LBOs as diet deals, because in order to force companies to shrink because managers of companies, public companies, don't like to shrink voluntarily. Okay? You've got only one box left. All right? And that's the private, that's the public. Now, the point I'm making here is that you shouldn't presume that all activities should be publicly owned, but if they're publicly owned, it has something to do with human capital. And the reason is that um, if you have com companies that are all human capital, they can't be public. If you have companies like commercial real estate, that don't need human capital, they don't need to be public. And so the implication is that there's something about public corporations that depend on the mix of human capital and other kinds of um, valuable assets other than human capital that makes the organization work and be tolerably efficient. 
Okay, so that's the first message. You see why it's important to governance? Because sometimes we think of governance as a kind of zero-sum game in which the problem is to uh, get more for the stockholders and <coughs> by cutting down compensation to those overpaid CEOs. Now that treats the business as a zero-sum game. It almost implies that the object is to reduce the compensation to the human capital to the lowest value attainable. If you think of that that generally, it doesn't make sense. Because the human capital is there, you've got to reward it. Okay. Let me give you a, 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 uh, um, an example now. Let's move on. And let's assume we're in the middle box, and we do have a mature company that's profitable, probably still growing to some extent, a company that can pay out money to, to investors, but it's not a company in decline where the problem is to shrink the company, okay? And we might ask, how efficient could that kind of business be? And how would we think about whether that business is efficient or not? Okay, so that's our second task. So here's something that, um, whoops, sorry. Here's something I hope will explain what's going on. This will take just a little bit of explanation. And I'm comparing Ford in 1975 and Ford in 2005. Toyota in 1975 and Toyota in 2005. The reason it stops in 2005 is that at, it, at that time, I had these circles pretty well calibrated. And then you go through the financial crisis and Ford almost goes down the drain. And uh, if I, I, basically the financial crisis, if I try to do this right now, the financial crisis would screw it up. So I'm gonna show you the numbers that I had calibrated in uh, 2005, 2006, okay? Now the way you read these charts is as follows. The area of each circle is the total market value of the business. Okay, and in 1975, Ford and Toyota, as well as I could calibrate it, were the total market value in those businesses was about the same. The difference was that in Japan, they didn't have as good governance by Anglo-Saxon standards. And what that, me me what that meant is that the share of the pie that goes to insiders, or that went to insiders in Japan, was und undeniably greater than in the US with Ford. So I've represented that by saying that in uh, Toyota, let's say two, what's that, one third of the total value goes in one way or the other to the insiders. Either it's job security or managerial rents or um, perks, whatever you want to call it. And at Ford, let's say it's a quarter. Okay, now let's suppose you could go back to 1975 and I'm going to give you $100,000, and you get to choose, with hindsight, whether you want to invest $100,000 in Toyota or Ford. Which would you choose? What? Toyota. Much higher, percent, much higher rate of return to investors. Right? In other words, with hindsight, you would have earned a lot more money on your stock portfolio putting the money in Toyota than in Ford. Now, how could that be? Well, if you hold the proportions of the pie constant, and Toyota manages to increase the total pie faster, the stockholders earn a higher percentage rate of return over time, even though they had a smaller share of the pie. See the idea? Right. So this poses a governance question. From the point of view of the stockholders, what do you want to get if I gave you the choice? Do you want a larger share of the pie? Or would you like a higher rate of return on your money? I think you'd like a higher rate of return on your money. Is that fair? So don't confuse zero-sum games in which govern people talking about governance say, we think stockholders ought to have a larger share of the pie. Maybe that's true sometimes. With a question of what's more efficient uh, in managing the company. Okay? Okay. You think you got the point? Now, can I show you a simple example of how you might imagine this all working? 
This is a very simple numerical example. I, I could do it mathematically if you wanted, but I don't think you want. Okay? All right. Now what we're going to do is to imagine an expanded balance sheet. It's a market value balance sheet. It has the value of the firm on the left, and it has debt, potentially, but then I've taken the equity and split it up in two pieces. One piece we'll call the present value of managerial rents. The other is the piece that goes to outside stockholders. So R and E. And it's almost as if the company had two classes of common stock. There's an inside class and an outside class. Now I understand that the inside class is implicit because it's the present value of all the, we'll call them rents, that the management team, not just the CEO, but all the managers get from being in the business. Whatever it is that makes the managers reluctant to leave their jobs and go out and start fresh in some other business is in R. So it could be job security, it could be the value they contribute because they know the organization or they know the products or whatever. Could be perks, could be nice retirement plans, but whatever it is, that the insiders value when they think about their place in the firm, that goes in the R. Fair enough? And as the, as the, as the picture, the circles I showed you a minute ago indicate, I think that R, even in the United States, is probably in the order of 20% or a quarter of the whole pie. Japan, my guess is, a third. Developing economies, of course, much greater. Okay, so let's look at a simple numerical example. Uh, we've got assets worth 100, debt for the moment equals zero. Uh, we'll assume the cash flows just give it $10 per year perpetuity, and the cost of capital is 10%, therefore the value of the firm is, um, whoops, sorry. What, what did I do here? Yeah, I want to go here. I'm sorry. Okay, I finally got the right one. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong screen down here. They have two of them up. So you see the value of the firm is 100? 10 divided by 0.1 is 100. Debt is zero to make it simple. So all we got to do is to figure out how to split up the 100 between what goes to the insiders and what is captured by the outsiders. Well, here's a simple way of thinking about that. Let's suppose that uh, governance gives the outside stockholders the right to 80% of the profits. Now, one simple way of modeling that, although it's grossly oversimplified, is to say that the, the, the outside stockholders do in the end have property rights and they can intervene throughout the managers, but if they do, they uh, suffer a 20% transaction cost of getting it all done. All right. So in that case, you can see what the equilibrium is. Equilibrium is that the insiders who control the decisions pay out enough to the stockholders to keep them just happy enough not to intervene. In other words, the insiders have to pay out enough to the stockholders to keep the stock price at 80. Because 80 is all they would get if they exercise their property rights. Now this is a very simple reduced form or of saying governance is obviously much more complicated than that, but my point is that governance, the governance system defines the split between what goes to insiders and what goes to outsiders. Okay? Make sense? All right. Um, so you can see what's going to happen. The uh, shares are going to sell at 80. There's an implicit equi equity class we'll call rents, PV of rents, which is really worth 20. You won't see it, but I won't see it explicitly, but you know it's there. You can see it more explicitly because the, you can think of the cash flow for the project, which is 10, and say, okay, 20% of that goes from the insiders in some form that compensates them for the human capital. The other eight goes outside, and therefore the shares sell at 80. Okay? Now you can see where this is going, because if we hold the fractions, if we hold governance constant, that is like saying we're going to hold the fraction that goes to the insiders and the fraction that goes to the outsiders constant. And then the trick is, if the insiders can take a long view, 
and maximize the value of their claim on the firm, you're automatically going to maximize the value of the stockholder's claim on the firm. Let's take a simple example. Um, we've got an investment opportunity that's going to cost you 10, but it's going to generate cash flows, a nice perpetuity of 1.5. Therefore, the project has an NPV of plus 5. Invest 10, you get cash flows worth 15. That's a good project. Will the managers do it? Well, here's what happens. Um, in order for the managers to do it, uh, they have to put up some money on their own. Okay? Remember, we have this constraint that keeps the fraction at 80-20. Now, if it were possible for the managers to say, forget about the constraint, we're just going to cut the dividends or cut the payout to zero and invest the stockholders' money in this, of course they'd be happy to do it. But there is a constraint. That was governance means. It's a way of splitting the value. So what happens is that the insiders, you can think of them as saying, okay, we'll give up one period's rent in order to get the 2.3 later. And of course that's a positive NPV from their point of view. And the, uh, with, with that, the stockholders are happy to give up their payout because they get 80% of the cash flows from the project. So the 2.3 is the two that the managers got before plus 20% of the cash flows from the new project, which is 0.3. The 9.2 is the um, 8 that the stockholders got before plus 1.2, which is 80% of the original. So the shared investment and shared returns. Okay. Now, let me just pause here uh, and say one of the problems with the way people think about governance is that they assume that the managers can simply invest the stockholders' money and not put up any of their own. Now, of course, if that were possible, the uh, Managers would just, well, they invest whatever they wanted because it never cost them anything. But if you think about it that way, you're basically saying whatever the governance is, it's not binding on their actions. If the governance is binding, there has to be some kind of shared sacrifice. Okay? Now notice, in this setup, the managers would voluntarily take all positive NPV projects that would be totally efficient. So you might, now you might say, just to make this complete, what if the managers don't want to give up their rents this period? Well, they borrow the money. Okay? And therefore, they maintain their rents this period at two, and the stockholders get their eight. But of course, now what you've done is put a $10 senior claim that's senior to both the managers and the stockholders in front of them, exactly the same decision. So when I say that the managers have to co-invest, they don't literally have to give up their rents, but they have to accept a senior claim, which is corporate borrowing. And in fact, it'll be typically much more efficient for the managers uh, to do the, let the corporation borrow than for um, there to try to manage the time, value, time pattern consumption with personal borrowing. But this is, see, this is an ideal situation. The managers do the right thing always. The stockholders always get the highest rate of return possible. Everything's efficient, even though those greedy managers are taking out 20% of the uh, gross, gross cash flows. You see what I'm trying to drive home here? You don't want to think of corporate governance as the result of some zero-sum game in which at a point in time you fix the size of the pie and then try to get a large, larger slice for you. That's the implicit view of a lot of popular discussions of corporate governance. The economic problem is to set up corporate governance so that you can get efficient investment and maximize the value of the whole circle, not the shares. Right? And that should be the objective. Okay. Um, great, said that. Now, now here's where the interesting corporate finance starts coming in, because we have an ideal situation, you can think immediately of all sorts of things that are going to go wrong. 
Managers are risk averse, more risk averse than investors because the managers can't diversify. Aha, so we got a problem. How do we solve it? Do we give top managers options whose value depends on risk so that they can be in, have the incentive to not play it too safe? So we're in, all of a sudden into the issue of management compensation. The other problem is that CEOs may be short term, short term, right? So a CEO individually who has only five years left on the job might say, heck, I'm going to just extract as much as I can from the corporation now, and the heck with a longer term view. That's a worry too. We usually think of the problem being that, uh, it, that investors are short sighted and managers have the long view, but I think in many cases the problem is the other way around. Nevertheless, uh, there's a paper that Viral Acharya and I and Raghu Rajan wrote that addressed that problem. It could work, even with a short-sighted CEO. Uh, problems of debt overhang, uh, moral hazard problems created by the opportunity to default, financial distress, all the classical corporate finance problems come back in. Um, you can then look at frictions and imperfections in financial markets, see what kind of problems they cause. Um, obviously, if you have really lousy governance, as you might have in some emergency economies, this can't be efficient, right? Because you, probably the best example would be Russia uh, 10, 15 years ago, where stockholders basically had no effective rights, and in that case, obviously, everything breaks down. You need effective governance and stable governance. And then the last problem I worry about is that sometimes people will try to implement too tight governance in order to make sure that the CEOs don't earn too much money and end up playing zero or negative sum games instead of trying to set things up so that the firm does the right thing in the long run. And all of these topics, well, most of them anyway, uh, are covered in one way or another in the research either I have done or am doing. But it's developed on this model that I've explained to you. So, how do you think about corporate governance? Corporate governance ought to be a, something that, first of all, protects investors. We've got to have that. But it also ought to work in such a way that the stockholders and the managers' interests are aligned over time in order to maximize not shareholder wealth necessarily, but corporate wealth, which is the size of the whole pie. The problem with saying maximize shareholder wealth is that it, it, it tempts people to say, I want a larger share of the pie. That's not necessarily efficient. I think generally it is not efficient. Um, and the other, thing to remember, the other things to remember is that if you're going to have a company that's public in the first place, it's almost surely going to have important human capital which has got to be rewarded. There's nothing wrong with managerial rents, this R that I'm talking about. And efficient governance avoids the zero-sum games and tries to set things up so the manager's own interest will be to maximize market value. And stable governance can be more important than tight governance. Go back to those pie charts with Toyota and Ford. The underlying assumption was that the governance was stable and that the one-third share that the Japanese insiders were taking was stable and the one-quarter share that Ford was taking was stable. And therefore, anything to maximize the value of the whole corporation made both stockholders and insiders better off. And I have some references if you want to look at them later. I don't know how many times we have time for questions or comments. You tell me when we run out of time, but I'd love to hear from you. I'm just curious, the 20 percent, I'm curious, the 2080 split, is that statistics in your own evaluation, or is it uh, influenced? In other words, like private equity splits or, you know, uh, well, well, how does it come from, that 80, 20? That is, why is it 80 and not uh, 35 or 50 or something yeah, like that? No, yeah, exactly. I, it's a judgment it might be, but I'll tell you one place you can look. Look at takeover premiums. Right? So company B gets a hostile takeover from company A. 
and the premium is, let's say, 20%. I think that 20% uh, is the capture of the target manager's rents by the people who are taking over. I don't think you should explain merger premiums by saying, oh my God, we've got these enormous synergies. Sometimes, yes. A large part of the takeover premium for mature companies is recapture of rents. And I think 20, if you think about it that way, I think 20% is about right. Oh. I, I just wanted to have a, a short footnote. Does that mean when in private equity puts it back in the public that there's a discount? Yeah, I think it is. And okay, they've, so got to improve, they've got to improve it enough so that they can recover the rents on the back end. Okay, thank you. Uh, on the way out, I meant. You don't. Somebody back, back here, sir? Yeah, how do you see the differences in the governance models between U.S. and European corporations? And which uh, models, if there are differences, do you think are more healthy? Uh, I think they can be equally healthy. So let's, let's take a, I'm oversimplifying, but let's take a German corporation where uh, labor and the public interest, let's say, has a much greater weight I would, versus, let's say, U.S. or U.K. company. Um, according to the way I now think of it, I can say those can be equally efficient. It may be that a German company, the slice of the pie taken by insiders broadly defined is higher. Maybe like Japan, it's one-third instead of 20 percent. But as long as that fraction is stable, and as long as the insiders who are actually making the decisions are trying to maximize the value of their slice of the pie, fine. Okay? So I don't, I hope you don't think this is too abstract an argument, but you see the implication? Uh, the implication is that stability is much more in governance, is much more important than the actual share that is captured by insiders and outsiders. Now, obviously, if you go to Russia in 1995, uh, this kind of analysis breaks down. I'm talking about developed economies. I mean, the issue you're talking about here is, I think, fundamental to a lot of PE deals, where we have management teams and we're trying to align ourselves to management teams. The problem where governance, I think, falls apart, and I, I'm not sure how you normalize for it, is when you have uh, different outlooks on future potential rents and where investors may see a different direction being appropriate versus managers, or they have different sets of information, and governance becomes mess, much less efficient because you're no longer actually dealing just purely a split of rents. It's your, suddenly your risk rates are different and your outcomes are very different or your perceived outcomes are different. So I'm not sure how you've addressed that or you've thought about it. This, this particular setup does, does not handle that and I'll acknowledge the problem. I tried to I think the problem often arises when you get companies that go over the top and start shrinking, getting into the aging mode. And that's particularly the situation where the insiders will insist that prospects are still good and we got to keep investing. And the outsiders are saying, well, wait a minute. Uh, you're protecting, you're not investing to increase the size of the overall pie, you're protecting their rents. So that's one category that this way of thinking about it clearly identifies. Um, I suppose that there's similar things with growth firms, where the opportunity for a divergence of opinion is very, very large. And of course, we're always looking for optimistic investors for an IPO. But you're right, it can, this kind of fundamental disagreement about prospects or what should be done also comes up for the middle box. And uh, what I've done so far can't say very much about it. Over here? I don't know whether. Right, just thinking about um, the current issues in the banking industry, and particularly the banking industry here in the UK, um, if you incorporate a, a regulatory interest in the model, um, which is meant to be um, representing customers, um, and if you overlay um, time constraints on the ability to, to um, generate value on the part of, uh, of the insiders, 
does the whole thing become dysfunctional? I'm sure we could run out scenarios where it does. Um, I can't help saying that the, uh, the banking business or the investment banking business is the perfect example of this, right? You have outside equity and you have inside equity and it's called the bonus pool. And so it's very explicit in that business how the, how the, rents, are, how the rents are shared. Now, um, I think I better be honest and say that, the, that the, the models I built so far don't get that far. So we, we and I could talk about it offline, but I can't give you a, I can't give you an answer that comes directly out of the work, out of the research I've done. No? Yes, sir. Uh, I was just a bit puzzled by your use of Ford as an example. Surely the insiders there were unions that were granted um, pension and health care benefits, and the managers in 1975 handed over those benefits without properly accounting for them. So in the short term, they may have had an incentive by not paying pay increases, which dented short-term profits. But because the accounting treatment was inefficient, they handed over a, a, a large share that went not to shareholders over the following 30 years. I'm amazed your share stayed constant in your <laughs> So well, uh, how, how would your model account for that? Uh, you're, you're, I mean, you're absolutely right. My example kept the shares constant for pedagogical purposes, you understand, right? But I agree with you 100% that if you went back to Ford in the 1980s, let's say, the, uh, what the unions were getting was really in that R, okay? And um, one, of the, one of the problems here, it's not in this presentation, but it does fall out of the models that I've been working on, is that the insiders in the corporation are different from the outsiders in one important respect. That they want to smooth the rents they take out every period of time. They want stable rents. Whereas uh, stockholders, I think, are not so much interested in stable rents, they just want value. Stockholders can soak up a lot of variance because they can diversify. Insiders can't. And uh, that's particularly true for union contracts, right? Because everything is stabilized, all the rents are stabilized. And you're absolutely right that that causes problems because it's almost like having a debt obligation. The rent is no longer an equity claim, but partly a debt claim, and you can see where that goes. So I'm agreeing with you. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I suppose the conclusion from your analysis is that um, the more human capital a company has, the higher those insider rents should be uh, versus the equity holders, right? Yes. So, so let's say, as you mentioned, with an investment bank where approximately, let's say, 50% goes to insiders, is, is that number almost an unavoidable number or even the most desirable number if you, if, if you do some analysis on it? Well, I, again, I'm reporting, before I answer, I'm trying not to just, issue, I'm not trying know. to give you off the cuff opinions. I'm going to say, what, what does this theories that I've been, these models I've been building off over the years tell us, okay? Now, uh, let's go particularly to that. Um, it may be that investment, I think you're right, that the more human capital there is in the business, the higher the R is, okay? Um, at some point that breaks down because you end up in the limit with a consulting firm where we know it's not going to work. So the interesting question is what holds investment banks together even though the human capital is so great and that's why I gave you that Goldman Sachs exception. I think what holds it together is that the organizational capital, uh, I'll call it that, that a big financial organization has allows it to operate even though it's uh, dependent on human capital to a large extent. But if human capital gets too big, then you don't want to be public. It's just inefficient. Thank you very much.